You're listening to A Climate Change. This is Matt Matter, your host, and I've got Ina Braverman on the program. Ina is the uh, CEO of Echo Wave Power. She started the company at the tender age of 24. It's now listed on NASDAQ. Uh, Ina has a really powerful story. She was born in the Ukraine, uh, and uh, she's won all kinds of awards, installed a, a wave uh, farm in Gibraltar back in 2016. She was selected by Smithsonian Magazine as one of the eight young innovators <clears throat> uh, with ingenious ideas for the future of energy. She spoke to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament back in 2017. She's done three different TED Talks. In 2020, she was profiled by Sustainable Markets uh, Initiative curated by then Prince Charles, now King Charles. So you have to tell us about uh, maybe if you know the king. Uh, and then recently met with Hillary Clinton. So uh, you've been busy and amazing stuff that you're doing. Tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your story. We're loving the opportunity to talk to you, Ina. Thank you very much. So, uh tell you how I started, what, what do you mean by telling sure. the story? Sure, yeah, why don't, yeah I, that wasn't a very well-framed question on my part. Let me try that again. Um, you know, just because I'm a lawyer doesn't mean I come up with good questions all the time, or maybe because I'm a lawyer, I don't come up with good questions. Um, so anyway, the, the question is maybe uh, take us back to the beginning. What, uh, what brought you to this, uh, this idea of creating wave power? So that's actually kind of an interesting and personal story. Uh, I live in Israel, but I wasn't born here. I was born in Ukraine in 1986. And the two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, which was the largest in history in nuclear disaster in terms of costs and casualties. And uh, I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of the explosion. Uh, I actually had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. Uh, luckily, my mother, uh, she's a nurse, and she approached my crib on time and gave me mouth to mouth resuscitation until the ambulance came and saved my life. So I got a second chance in life. And uh, I don't remember any of that. I was a baby. But, you know, growing up in all the family meetings and gatherings, everybody in my family would say, wow, that's so cool. You got a second chance in life. You know, you should really do something, you know, good with it. And that's kind of how I grew up with the feeling of purpose. Like I really should do something good with the second chance that I got in life. And when I was four years old, my family immigrated from uh, Ukraine to Israel. And we settled in a small town in the north of Israel called Apo. And it wasn't exactly the city of opportunities. So there not, was not too much like startups or like technology back then. Like it was a very uh, kind of small city in Israel, still a small city. Uh, so when I grew up, I decided to study political science and English literature in Haifa University, it's a university in the north of Israel, in the hope of becoming kind of, you know, this great politician that will make peace in the Middle East or, you know, kind of the naiveness of, uh, and the innocence of somebody in their early 20s. And when I finished my university, there was no lineup of politicians that were waiting to hire, you know, a young lady with a degree in political science and English language and literature. So actually the first job that I found was as English Hebrew translator for a renewable energy company. And then there I kind of discovered the whole, let's call it magical world of renewable energy. I learned about solar and wind and the uh, wave power and whereas solar and wind were already like, there was not too much to renew in those fields. Um, and there was a lot of competitions, the product kind of and the technology was already fully developed and everybody were kind of fighting for the same piece of the same pie, I would call it. And wave energy was something that all the engineers and scientists said that like it's an amazing source and it can provide much more than other energy sources because wave energy is the least intermittent source of renewable energy. And even according to the World Energy Council, it can produce twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now. Uh, and although like it's such a huge source, no matter how much I researched it, I saw that no company, no matter how big it is or how much financial human resources connection it had, like no company was able to make it a reality to commercialize wave energy. So I didn't have the money, I didn't have the technical background, I didn't have the contacts. Uh, so I said to myself, these huge companies cannot do it, I can do it. Again, the innocence of being in your early 20s. And I started really researching uh, in databases, uh, books, anything that I could find. 
where did other companies fail? And uh, I kind of found like a common ground to all the failures of all the other companies. And I came up with my own kind of ideas of how to commercialize wave energy. But of course, again, I didn't have even the money to register the patent, let alone to you know build the power station. So I kind of put it aside as unrealistic. And then one day I went to a social event and a guy came and sat next to me and he told me, what's your passion? And I said, wave energy, because that was something that I was really into. And it turned out that he's a serial entrepreneur and one of his investments is a surf hotel in Panama. And when he was there at another, at the completely other side of the world, he was looking at people doing marine sports and saying to himself, wow, there must be something better that you can do other than marine sports with, you know, with the power and the energy in the waves. And also started kind of researching wave energy. So when I told him wave power, that was my passion, is my passion, uh, it was kind of match made in business heaven. And he ended up investing the first $1 million into the company. And that was the beginning of Eco Wave Power. So when I was 24, I co-founded the company. That's an amazing story. Uh, you know, uh, I guess it's a, it's a testament to following your dreams and putting in the hard work to get there, because obviously you did a lot of work to kind of prepare yourself for the opportunity, and then the opportunity kind of arose and, and you were ready for it. So uh, kudos to you for doing, doing the work. So then, uh, as those of us who've started companies know the you know the start is um is great but then you got to do the the next level so tell us about what took you to the next level and how did you get your technology patented and uh what what was that next step like so after opening the company like uh we wanted to check if the ideas that we had are actually like feasible engineering wise and so on and uh, we wanted to do it with the minimum possible cost because you know until you know that you actually have a product you don't really want to invest a lot of money so what i did uh, was going back to ukraine to the same city that i was born uh, and doing a competition between 300 engineers and hiring a team of five engineers to actually take kind of our concepts and ideas into like real sketches and blueprints and so on so uh, when that happened, we registered our first patent, which was an international PCT that protects the technology and the patent in uh, like 160 countries. And uh, we started doing testing. And the first testing was a wave pool testing in the Hydromechanical Institute in Kiev, actually. Uh, again, we chose uh, to do the testing in Ukraine because the costs were much lower than they are in Israel, also in the US, I guess. Uh, after we did the testing in the Hydromechanical Institute, we went to our first real conditions implementation, which was first in Crimean Peninsula, and then we moved it to the port of Jaffa in Israel. Uh, it operated in Jaffa port for six years, and now we removed kind of the demo power station and installed instead of it larger scale, a 100 kilowatt installation that we did with co-funding co from the Israeli Energy Ministry, which recognized our technology as pioneering technology and EDF Renewables IL, which is a subsidiary of the French National Electrical Company. Um, so I think the thing that we did kind of the best or kind of the best move that we did in our development journey was that we were very, very fast uh, to test the equipment and the technology in real conditions. Many of the companies, especially offshore wave energy developers, uh, which is like in the middle of the ocean or in the middle of the sea, they spent tens, 10 years, 20 years, sometimes even more, like for R&D, like computerized uh, R&D and like wave pool testing, and they don't actually go and put it in real conditions. And I really believe that like some of the phenomena and like behavior of the waves and of the ocean is not really that easy to forecast. So like you really need to go and put it out there in order to uh, discover the real problem and challenges of the technology. And the fact that we really went fast into the real conditions, I think, uh, Give us the opportunity to learn much more. Well, I, I definitely think that uh, taking the chance to fail is is a great chance to learn. And and those who are too afraid to fail uh, don't learn as much. And that's a, a great example of your kind of willingness to put yourself out there, test your technology, and and then you have a faster learning curve because you failed, uh, you know, or things didn't work out as well. Then you make a change and you're constantly improving it. So uh, I'm looking forward to the next segment of asking you more about how you 
how you took that first generation uh, technology and improved it to kind of get to your next gen and and where you're at and kind of where the where the cost curve goes uh, going forward because I've read that uh, that it the cost curve of wave energy is supposed to be going down pretty rapidly in the future. So you can tell us a little bit more about that and we come back from the break. You're listening to A Climate Change. I've got Ina Braverman, uh, CEO of Echo Wave Power on the show, and uh, looking forward to talking with her about all these issues after we come back from the break. And you're listening to A Climate Change. I've got Ina Braverman, CEO of Echo Wave Power on the show. And Ina, right before the break, uh, we were talking about uh, the cost of wave power and your iterations on the technology. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about uh, how your technology evolved uh, from your first prototypes to where it is today. So in the first prototype that we were doing, that we were testing in the Hydromechanical Institute in Kiev, we were basically testing a number of different floater shapes to see which floater shape basically the most optimally kind of takes, absorbs the power of the waves and, you know, generates energy for the energy generation process to commence. Uh, it was a small scale uh, kind of power station with a, a direct drive. So there was basically a floater that directly drives a generator. Then our, uh, let's call it next generation of the real conditions was much larger scale floaters already. The conversion system became a hydraulic conversion system, which enables basically continuous supply. So it does not uh, fluctuate when in the time difference between one wave and and basically, we kept improving and improving the technology according to uh, data that we collected, uh, operational data that we collected from operating in real conditions. So, for example, uh, we have a patented storm protection mechanism that when the waves are too high for the system to handle, the floaters automatically go up above the water level and they lock in the upper position until the storm passes. In our first test, kind of the storm uh, protection mechanism, we would leave the floater. But then we would see that the wind would blow very strong because when there's a storm, also the wind blows strong. So the floater would get kind of, it would start hitting its own locks. It would be moving. So we understood that we have to change the locking mechanism into something that is very robust, that does not enable any movement. Because if it has any movement, then the floaters will hit its own locks and due to its heavy weight, relatively heavy weight, will probably break its uh, locks. Uh, so basically, we kept improving, also developing our own proprietary uh, automation and control system that without the control system, we can produce, let's say, X amount of electricity, and with the control system, 5X of electricity. So we keep innovating, we keep submitting patents. EcoWave Power at this point has 18 patents and patents pending. 13 of them are already approved, and we keep submitting more as we develop more. Well, that's great. Uh, so are you looking at, at some point in time, licensing your technology to, to other companies or keeping it all kind of proprietary? So right now, we're not really looking into licensing, except providing licenses to our joint ventures. When we establish a joint venture to penetrate a new market, then we provide that joint venture kind of a license for our technology. Uh, our preferred revenue streams or working models, let's call it, is the either turnkey when we sell the equipment to a third party or to a JV that we establish. A uh, second option is BOT when we build, operate, and then transfer the assets. Uh, sometimes to, it's possible to transfer to institutional investors that can pay premium price for the power stations. And the most preferred one, especially for locations with great wave patterns and good feeding tariffs, good price per kilowatt hour, is BOO, when we build on and operate the power stations for 25 years, and then we make our money from the sale of electricity to the grid for the duration of the project. And think of it kind of like building a building, and instead of selling the apartments, you're renting the apartments and making money for 25 years from the rent. So uh, where do you see uh, your next steps? And I know you have a, a lot of contracts out there to build systems and provide power. Kind of where are you at on that in that uh, in that process? So basically, right now we're we finished the construction of our newest project in Israel, uh, which will be the first project in Israel history. Uh, where wave energy kind of officially connects to the Israeli uh, national grid. So people that live next to Jaffa Port, it's in Tel Aviv, will be actually able to open their TV or operate their washing machine 
using energy from the power of the waves, which is very cool. Um, we also signed the first PPA, Power Purchase Agreement in the history of Israel between the Israeli Electrical Company and a wave energy developer, Eco Wave Power. Uh, we're also penetrating the US market, which we see as a strategic market for us. We're basically focused mostly on the European and the US market. The European one, because it's the most advanced in terms of regulation and legislation and grants and policies for wave energy. And the US market, because right now we feel like it's really opening up to renewable energies uh, with many ambitious goals and support mechanisms such as the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there's also two legislation initiatives for wave energy specifically being promoted, one in New Jersey and one in California, which is very excited, exciting and it's something very, very new for the United States. And uh, we're planning soon to open our first proof of concept or pilot uh, in Alta C at Alta C's premises at the Port of Los Angeles. Uh, where we actually met and the very would be love we would love to invite you to come uh, for a visit as soon as the power station opens uh, from what i know it will be the first kind of onshore near shore uh, wave energy power station which will be super cool also because you know as opposed to the offshore installations where nobody can actually go and visit it because all the conversion mechanism is inside a floater in the middle of the ocean here like it will have full like people, media, students, investors will have full access to the power station and we will be able to see how wave energy is being harnessed like in real time. Well, it's certainly uh, an amazing project there out at all to see uh, Terry Tamman, former EPA, California EPA, uh, I guess, uh, secretary um, who was under Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, started that, or he, I guess he didn't start it. He's now the current CEO of it. And so he's brought together some amazing thinkers and, and doers like yourself. And it's it's an amazing uh, kind of place. Uh, so tell us in terms of where where does that Alta C project go next? Uh, how 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 long do you have to, to launch it to the next level? So we already shipped the conversion unit. So the energy conversion unit is already at Alta C along with one floaters, one floater. Uh, the demonstration unit is planned to be with up to eight floaters and an install capacity of up, up to 100 kilowatts. Uh, right now we're at the licensing point, so we're waiting and submitting. We're submitting some documents to the Port of LA, and then the Port of LA will issue the proper licenses in order for us to be able to actually take the conversion unit and the floaters and connect it to the jetty that is located in front of uh, Alta C. Um, and as soon as we finish the licensing, we will be able to produce seven additional floaters and uh, you know start the operation of the system. And oh, the next sure. step for us, sorry, and I wanted to add that basically we're starting with a pilot project, but of course our goal and our ambition ambition is to go to commercial scale projects. So uh, the Port of Los Angeles has a very, very big external breakwater where we can install anywhere between 20 to 60 megawatts of power, which is already a substantial size of a wave energy power station. So of course our goal after building uh, the small proof of concept uh, and showcasing it kind of to the world and to the US, uh, is to go ahead and construct the lar larger scale installations, which are much more cost efficient and which can produce significant energy amounts. Tell us, uh, what is 20 to 60 megawatts of power? What does that kind of translate to for, for those of us who don't measure power for a living? <laughs> so it's about uh, 20,000 to 60,000 households. Oh, okay, that's, that's a lot of power, so... Um, then where does it go from here in terms of bringing the cost of wave energy down to, to the levels of solar and, and wind? So in commercial scale, the, the cost is already down because uh, when we reach a size of 20 megawatt and up, our price goes as low as $1.5 million in construction cost per one megawatt, which is from what I know is comparable to the cost of onshore wind, because offshore wind is more expensive, of course, uh, and is a bit higher than the price of solar energy. But uh, we have to take into account that uh, wave energy is much more stable source than solar energy. So whereas solar energy might, might cost less to install or to construct, but you have the night, you have winter, you have cloud coverage when, when solar doesn't produce any electricity and wave energy for a bit of higher cost can produce in suitable locations around the clock, which is a big advantage. 
Yeah, I've heard that uh, one of the advantages of having wave energy is that it's complementary to wind and solar and that so that the grid kind of doesn't need as many batteries because wave energy may be producing energy when solar or or uh, wind energy is not. So they kind of work together in a good way. So wave energy is not only complementary, it actually can be used as a base load source, meaning that Look, wind energy is very fluctuating. It's mostly uh, prevailing early in the morning or late at night when actually the population usage is at its lowest. Solar energy, you have, let's say in California, a lot of sun during the day, but then you have the night and solar energy stops producing. Wave energy, as we said, in suitable locations can operate around the clock. So basically wave energy can be used as a stabilizing source for both wind and solar energy. So really, if we want to have a 100% renewable energy friendly world or environmentally friendly world, then we definitely need to combine all renewable energy sources because different sources are prevailing during different times of the day, during different months in the year, seasons and so on. But when they're all combined together, they stabilize each other. And wave energy definitely can be the base source for that. Well, tell us a little bit about how the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a big funding source for environmental projects, is helping you and Wave Energy projects. So from what I know, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, has determined on certain amounts of money to be uh, contributed towards the development of wave energy or marine energy in general through different programs that are now being promoted by the DOE, the Department of Energy of the United States, and so on. It gives different tax incentives and different uh, kind of support policies for the promotion of renewable energies, which definitely helps, especially when you're a new technology and you need these kind of support mechanisms. Well, certainly, um, you know, we've subsidized the fossil fuel industry uh, with trillions of dollars of subsidies all over the place. So it makes sense to give some subsidies to new technology that actually isn't polluting. Uh, we would be well served to do that. Well, you're listening to A Climate Change. I've got Ina Braverman, who is the CEO of Echo Wave Power on the show. And uh, we'll be back in just one minute to talk to Ina further about uh, wave technology and how it can power the planet. You're listening to A Climate Change. This is Matt Matter, your host. And I've got Ina Braverman of Echo Wave Power on the program. Uh, Ina, tell us a little bit about uh, what makes Echo Wave Power uh, special, what uh, differentiates itself from other wave power technologies. So 99% of the wave energy developers decided to install their equipment offshore, which is four or five kilometers into the sea. So basically most developers took like kind of bulk huge floaters and they put inside the floaters all the expensive hydraulic, mechanical and conversion mechanism. And uh, this kind of approach created, I call it the five fear factors from wave energy or from offshore wave energy. So the first thing was prices. The prices of offshore wave energy were sky high because they needed and still need ships, divers, underwater mooring and cables. Uh, so a company called Pelamis from Scotland has installed a test site in Portugal uh, for a few hundred households for a development cost of around $150 million. Obviously, no 100 household will return a 100, over $100 million uh, investment. Um, the second problem was, even though large-scale investors had gave Pelamis and other companies that amounts of money, because they thought to themselves, okay, the price is super high right now, but it will decrease with the time. Unfortunately, such decrease never happened because in the offshore, there's wave of 20 meters and even higher. And unfortunately, no man-made stationary equipment can survive the loads over 20 meters wave height. So Pelamis, a company called Ocean Links, another one called Velo Oil, basically after a few months or a few days, in some cases of operation, found themselves total loss to the system. So a big wave comes, breaks the whole system, and all the expensive equipment is inside the floater, so it's a total loss. So the technologies were too expensive, breaking down all, all the time. Insurance companies saw that it's so you know expensive and breaking down that they, they were reluctant to insure offshore wave energy, and that's you know a blow to the industry because like if you can't get insurance, how can you fund the projects, especially new projects, new technologies? 
environmentalists, which were supposed to be the greatest proponents and supporters of wave energy, were actually objecting wave energy because it's connected to the ocean floor and uh, disturb the marine environment and disturb the ecological balance. And these companies, these offshore companies, got so preoccupied with trying to lower the price and up the reliability that most of them never got the chance to actually connect to the electrical grid. So on top of all their problems, there became a big question mark on whether wave energy can even safely connect to the electrical grid. Um, and that kind of was the issues or the problems that bothered, let's call it, all the investors and the industry. How do you solve this fight? So when David and I, we established ecoic power, we understood that like no solution would work other than a solution that solves these five specific problems. So basically, instead of going to the offshore, we did kind of something different than the whole industry. We decided to install on existing man-made structures, such as piers, breakwaters, jetties, and other types of marine structures. The only thing that is in the water are the floaters, which belong in the water, and all the expensive uh, conversion mechanism is on land, just like a regular power station. So that enabled us to significantly lower the prices. We built our first 100 kilowatt installation in Gibraltar for a price of $450,000 in comparison to the Pelamis $150 million. That's like a big you know, breakthrough in terms of the cost. Uh, we showed that we're reliable and that we can survive storms because when the waves are too high for the system to handle, as I said before, the floaters automatically rise above the water level and stay in the upward position until the storm passes. Because we're reliable and we're uh, cost efficient, we're also able to secure insurance from global reputable insurance companies, which makes it much more easy to invest in our assets. Uh, environmentalists are supporting us because we don't create any new presence on the ocean floor. We only connect to existent man-made structures. Uh, this man-made structure is mostly made of stones or cement. Uh, it's not prime real estate. It's not used for anything other than breaking the waves. So we're using kind of real estate that nobody needs and that kind of damaged the environment because cement in the water is not very friendly, but you had to build these breakwaters to protect like ports and coastal municipalities from you know, storms. So we take something that is bad for the environment, but necessary and is not prime real estate and we turn it into a source of revenues and a source of clean electricity, which is kind of repurposing the use. And we have been connected to the grid in Gibraltar for six years, proving that wave energy can kind of safely connect to a national electrical grid or to a microgrid and uh, kind of also solving that fifth problem. So I think that's kind of what the coal power did different and that's what really, you know, put us forward. Sounds like a genius plan. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, trying to start smaller, I think is, is a better plan than, you know, and of course uh, waves out there in the middle of the ocean are, are incredibly powerful. A friend of mine who was a naval architect would talk about how uh, some of those huge waves could just, you know, mangle even like an aircraft carrier or something because they're just so powerful. They can just smash things incredibly. So tell us uh, what's the next uh, step for, for Echo Wave Power in terms of getting some of these projects done and getting the financing and, and what do you need to, to kind of take it to the next level? So the next step for us, I think is like, we, as I said, we've proved that we can solve the five prevail, prevailing problems. And right now our next natural step uh, is to build larger scale installations and show that wave energy, not only that it can be cost efficient and reliable and insurable and environmentally friendly and safely connect to the grid, but that wave energy can actually be built in large scale to pro provide large amounts of electricity and to make money, to become profitable. Because in the end of the day, what is not profitable, even if it's an impact industry, does not survive. So our next kind of natural uh, goal and aspiration is to build the first commercial wave energy project in the world. So uh, how far off is that? Uh, and I, I definitely want to comment on the profitability aspect. I, I believe that um, a friend of mine and I were talking and, and he was saying, we've got to combine profitability along with the green part of the equation, that if we can marry kind of those two things together, then, uh, then you have something that's super powerful because otherwise it's really hard to draw in the money and it does take lots of money to build these things. So tell us uh, where you at on this journey to profitability. 
So basically, as mentioned before, wave energy, exactly like wind and solar, becomes profitable at the point that it reaches commercial scale. So our kind of forecasted, forecasted lowest construction cost is when we reach a scale of 20 megawatt and up. And given the fact that our preferred revenue stream is BOO, is built on an operator power stations, uh, we should have multiple kind of yielding assets on our balance sheet in order to be able to really show significant profitability, which is exactly what is done by other large scale renewable energy companies such as NL Green and such as other uh, green developers. So first step is building the first commercial scale power station and then kind of, you know, copying, pasting and copying and pasting to different locations, to different sites in the world, and then basically selling the electricity to the grids and profiting from that. So currently you have a number of contracts, is that correct, to, to build out stations or to, to start stations? Yes, we do. Tell, tell us a little bit more about uh, where your current uh, your current contracts are and and what uh, where they are at in the process of going from vision to uh, reality. So our most advanced project is the one in Israel that is about to open very soon. Uh, it's already uh, fully built and we're just pending the last approval to start selling the electricity to the grid. The next one that we're planning to launch is the Port of LA one. It will be our first project in the United States. Our first commercial installation is planned to be in Portugal, in a location called Barra do Douro Breakwater in the city of Porto. And there we signed a 20 megawatt concession agreement with APDL, that's the local port authority, for three different breakwaters that they own. Um, so that will be our first commercial one. On top of that, we have different agreements, one that we signed recently with Taiwan for developing the first pilot there. Usually we penetrate new locations with pilots, and then when they see that the pilot works well, then we get the commercial uh, kind of uh, orders for larger scale installation. Uh, we have, uh, I'm actually flying next week to Greece, to Heraklion port. We're now doing a detailed project planning for um, a project in Heraklion port, a two megawatt project. Uh, together with Drogon Associates, which is a large-scale Greek engineering company. So we're kind of a little bit all over the place, but as I said, mostly Europe and the US. Well, it sounds exciting. So um, in terms of finance, are, where, where are you guys getting the financing to, uh, to build these projects out? Or is that part of the contract that uh, your partners come up with money to, uh, to you know, help get these things off the ground? So right now we're funding uh, with kind of mixed methods of funding. Some project we fund with equity, some project we fund with grants. There's different grants available for wave energy development. Some projects are being funded with strategic partners, such as the Israeli project that is being co-funded by the Israeli Energy Ministry and by EDF Renewables IL. Uh, right now, one of the showstopper I would say for wave energy is the fact that because it's such a new technology, we still cannot get that financing. And really, in order to make a commercial rollout and build multiple, as we said, yielding power station or yielding assets, uh, that financing is key for solar and wind. Sometimes they provide 80 and even 90 percent of the cost of the installations and power stations. So as soon as Wave Energy will be able to get that financing as an additional source of uh, funding the project, and that would be amazing and will really kind of hurry up the execution of the project. Well, certainly. Uh... The bankers are holding the keys to, I think, the environmental movement in a lot of different ways, and we can talk about that after we come back from the break, but uh, you underline one of the most important things is getting people to loan you money and, and banks having some degree of confidence in, you know, a technology, um, though I think it probably makes sense to have the government give some guarantees to this type of funding to get an industry like this off the ground. So we'll be right back in one minute. Uh, my guest, Ina Braverman, CEO of Echo Wave Power. You're listening to A Climate Change and stay tuned. You're listening to A Climate Change. This is Matt Matter and your host. And I've got Ina Braverman, CEO of Echo Wave Power on the program. And Ina, we were just talking before the break about financing and um, and I think one of the main things that could help everybody is is degree of government financing to get 
uh, projects like uh, what you're doing, which are kind of on the cutting edge, but have tremendous promise, as you said earlier, that wave energy could have enough energy to to power the world two times over. So it seems worthy of of putting some money into to see if we can build it out and make it. And as you said, potentially as cheap or cheaper than wind and solar, which are already cheaper than coal and natural gas. So um, now, now what what is uh, California doing to uh, encourage this in terms of grants or tax breaks or things of that nature? So right now there's a, actually a new legislation initiative called SB 605, if I'm not wrong, by Senator Padilla, uh, which uh, is kind of uh, requesting or wanting to grant a certain amount of fund funding for both uh, research, feasibility studies, and actual implementation of a wave energy project in California. So that's uh, one initiative that uh, you know I think is very impressive. I even submitted a written testimony to the different uh, utilities committee and, and maritime committees uh, in order to kind of explain the advantages of wave energy. If we look at the United States, in the United States alone, according to the Energy Information Administration, wave energy can supply 66% of all the United States energy needs. If we're looking at California, California, according to NREL, um, can, can, wave energy there can supply 69% of all California's energy needs. Uh, if we're looking at the energy needs of 2018, and uh, California on its own can supply 3% of all the United States energy needs. So California definitely has one of the larger uh, resources in terms of wave energy in the US. So I definitely hope that this uh, bill initiative will pass. Uh, it already passed, uh, I think, the Appropriation Committee and the Senate committees and um, is heading for further approval. So I hope this will pass and other similar initiatives will pass as well. Well, certainly uh, that's something that all of us citizens can talk to our our representatives and senators, assembly people, to uh, encourage them to move this bill forward because uh, certainly more research and financing for this uh, very promising area to uh, produce such a large amount of energy in in a clean way is a uh, is a great idea. And and essentially, I mean, all utilities are public goods. Now we've granted them monopoly status and. I'm surprised that utilities haven't got more into the game regarding producing wave energy. Um, what do you think is going on there? And maybe uh, they have, and I just don't know it. So some utilities are going into the wave energy game. So for example, our partner, as I said, in the Israeli project uh, is EDF. EDF is a large scale utility. It's a French national electrical company. Uh, I'm sure that other utilities are going as well. Maybe in the United States is not as popular right now because again, wave energy was kind of slower in commercializing than solar and wind. And it's, we, we're only seeing now this year and last year, maybe the first kind of uh, initiatives for the promotion adoption of wave energy. But I do think that the more, you know, more legislation, regulation, licensing procedures, filling tariffs, are set by the government around wave energy, the more the utilities will participate as well. Okay, well, uh, before I before you go, do tell us a little bit more about how this technology actually works. And because uh, it, it is a fascinating technology, all of us have been out to the ocean, we see waves, so we're familiar with what it looks like in terms of uh, your raw materials. The question is, how do you convert it into electricity? So basically we attach unique floater shape to existing man-made structures such as piers, breakwaters, jetties. The floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves and they're pushing hydro cylinders, which transmit biodegradable fluid into land-located accumulators. A pressure is being built in the accumulators, the higher the waves, the higher the pressure, which is used to turn the hydro motor, turn in the generator, and the generator through an inverter sends clean electricity into the grid. And the whole system is controlled by a smart automation system that enables optimal supply of the clean energy from the waves to the grid. And it also activates our patented storm protection mechanism, 
that puts kind of the floaters in storm protection mode in the upward position every time there's a storm. And when the storm passes, lowers it back into the water and commences operation. So uh, how high can your um, floaters go up in the air to kind of avoid the, the strongest waves? So the floaters, basically it's according to the mechanical design, how high they go and according to the height of the wall in the specific location of implementation, basically they just go like that from kind of almost a 90 degree position, they go up and low. So it's not the point of like only lifting them above the water level, which helps of course during a big storm, but also it's the locking itself, kind of the floaters become a part of the wall and the, which starts getting like, instead of getting dynamic forces, the floater moving, the wave is moving. So dynamic forces against dynamic forces is a lot of forces. And uh, when you lift it up, it's like uh, dynamic forces of the waves hitting kind of a static wall. Like the floater becomes kind of a wall, which assists the survivability of the floaters in these forms. Well, that's a brilliant design. It's just uh, very simple, but elegant in uh, execution to kind of keep it safe. Uh, so, um tell us uh tell us a little bit about uh, kind of some of the most exciting things that you've done in in growing the company and and how you've grown kind of as a leader in uh in that process so i think uh, one of the most exciting moments was the opening of the gibraltar power station it was our first grid connected power station where we showed that the wave energy can safely connect to the electrical grid and I really feel that it made an impact, uh, also improving that wave energy is cost efficient, reliable, insurable, and 100% environmentally friendly. Another very kind of proud moment for me is the signing of the PPA with the Israeli electric uh, company, because uh, a wave energy developer never signed a PPA with the Israeli electrical company. It's the first time in the history of Israel that wave energy will officially connect to the electrical grid. So that's super exciting. Uh, EcoWave Power's IPO on NASDAQ US. We IPO the company in July 2021. That was a huge step for the company and we traded under the stock symbol Wave. Um, so I think there were many, many proud moments, uh, you know, as the, the CEO and the founder of the company. Uh, for me personally, uh, I received the Global Climate Action Award from the United Nations in the category of Women for Climate. And that was a very exciting moment because uh, I always say that being an entrepreneur is hard, but you know, being a female entrepreneur definitely adds an additional layer of difficulty uh, to kind of the entrepreneurial journey, especially in the energy industry. According to EY, like only 5% of the executive in the whole energy industry, not only renewable, are women, 95% are men. So uh, with this kind of uh, distribution, it's not always the easiest uh, to succeed at this field. So definitely, you know, that was a pr proud moment for me. That's uh, that's incredible set of accomplishments uh, for anybody, and you're still going. The best is yet to come. So, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing uh, great things as you move forward. Uh, you've met a lot of uh, great leaders in the environmental movement. Can you name four off uh, the top of your head that would kind of be as they say in the U.S., the Mount Rushmore, where we have four great presidents up on the, uh, you know, carved into a mountainside, who would be your four top environmental leaders? So definitely say Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, who also came recently to visit our power station at Alta C in the port of Los Angeles. Like he's kind of known as the, you know, former governor that did most towards, uh, you know, the acceleration of renewable energy sources adaptation in California. He's responsible for the uh, roofs initiative, the solar roof initiative in California. So he pushed a lot of uh, positive legislation for adaptation of renewable energy. Uh, I met recently Hillary Clinton, uh, which I know also is very, very passionate about the environment and has her own kind of ideas uh, on how to improve and accelerate the development of renewable energy sources in the United States. Uh, two more, I don't know, the, the, two, the two last ones that I met, to be honest, so uh, I don't have right now two more off the top of my head, my head, but like definitely there's many. Ah, maybe I would like to say Robert Karabinchak, which is an assemblyman from New Jersey, who kind of pushed forward and uh, wrote the first uh, legislation initiative for promotion of wave energy 
in New Jersey, and probably also Senator Fadila from uh, California that is pushing the SB 605 uh, legislation initiative. Well, that's uh, that's a great list. Uh, and Terry, remember... Terry, never forget Terry. <laughs> Terry <laughs> from Alta C is definitely a big pioneer uh, in renewable energy and what he's doing with Alta C and the Blue Hub there is really, really amazing and inspiring. And really, if there would be more hubs like this in the United in other states and also uh, in Europe and in other uh, countries around the world, then it would really accelerate the uh, adoption of renewable energy sources. Well, that's a that's a great idea. What, an idea I can definitely stand behind. Uh, Ina Braverman, uh, thanks for joining us on the program. Uh, CEO of Echo Wave Power. You should follow Ina uh, on all her social channels uh, and check her company out. She's listed on Nasdaq. Uh, it's a bright has a bright future. Uh, it was so great having you on the show. Um, so everybody check out our website at climatechange.com. You can follow us on Spotify as well as Apple Music. Uh, listen to all the 100 plus episodes we have up there. Um, and uh, go tell us uh, when you go there, give us a good review. Also, uh, send us any questions you might have. And uh, we'd be happy to address those on future shows. And uh, tune in next week. And we'll do what you can over the course of the next week to improve the environment. Go out and talk to your elected officials, volunteer, um, do what you can to help improve our environment. Talk to people and take action. So be the change you want to see in the world.